Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Joshua Elliott. I am the executive officer of the AOC's Office of Language Access, and I feel very privileged to talk with you today about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Of course, we're talking about language access. Um, it's a new world. It's a little bit of a strange setup today. I'm, I normally do this in front of a live studio audience, you might say. So um, having said that, bear with me. Uh, I've got lots of information to share. If you have questions at the end of the presentation, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll give you my contact information on the very last slide. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if there's anything that I can assist with. Uh, on a personal note, I hope everyone's doing well. Again, it's, um, it's a strange world we live in right now. I hope you and yours are well. Stay safe. Uh, take care of yourselves out there. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, going to be a lot of fun today. We've got a lot of things to cover. So let's just move forward. The title of the presentation today is The Varying Roles of the Legal Interpreter in Judicial Settings in Kentucky, Pragmatic Guidance for Working with Individuals with Limited English Proficiency. You know, Kentucky specifically is becoming much more diverse. Um, I started in this field about 15 years ago, and it's amazing to really reflect on the changes that have taken place linguistically in our state over that amount of time. Uh, we have immigrant populations coming in and moving out, and that, of course, affects the type of work that we do at the Office of Language Access. Because of that, there's an expanded need for language access, for linguistic services of all types, not just what we might think of as on-site interpreters in court, Right? We do a lot of different things, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the different services uh, that are available and the ways that you might interact with linguistic professionals uh, out in the field. So let's get started. Objectives. To find court interpreting, I do want to talk a little bit about what it means when we refer to court interpreting. I think that sometimes we have preconceived notions about what interpreters actually do and, um, and about the work that the Office of Language Access does for the courts. I want to make sure that we're all on the same, the same page there. Uh, I want to review and discuss the roles, duties, and qualifications of interpreters in judicial settings in Kentucky. And notice there I did say roles, right? There's more than one thing that happens in judicial settings. Sometimes we lump it all together, right? We think, oh, he's, this person's an interpreter. They can just sort of do everything that I need uh, revolving around language today. Any, anything and everything, this person's got it covered. And that's not necessarily the case. There are very specific rules uh, that really govern the type of work that we as interpreters do in court. I want to make sure that we're all clear on what those rules are, what those roles are in different judicial settings. We will briefly review relevant laws, and I do mention briefly there. Uh, I've got lots of letters after my name. Uh, none of those letters happens to be a J or a D, so we're not going to talk a whole lot about law today, um, but I do want to mention some of the most important laws and rules that, again, govern the work that we do. Uh, more than anything, give you guys some reference materials to look back on if something should come up in the future. We will discuss attorney expectations when hiring an interpreter. You know, I'm constantly amazed. Having been in this profession well over a decade, I'm just amazed sometimes at how little thought is put into hiring a linguistic professional when attorneys are preparing an important case. Uh, that can really have very serious consequences uh, down, the, down the road a little bit, right? There can be adverse procedural consequences if the appropriate amount of thought isn't put in to that hiring process up front. I want to talk a little bit about that, give you guys some guidelines. How does that actually work? What should that look like? And I want to understand the modes of court interpreting and how interpreters actually work. Uh, we'll just do a very brief overview of sort of what you can expect when you go to court. And there's an actual bona fide court interpreter there. We'll talk about what that looks like a little bit. And I'm going to share some tips uh, for working with interpreters in legal settings. So. One size doesn't fit all. We have to understand how to approach each setting, each judicial encounter that you may have, and specifically in terms of language access and the language access professional that you engage for a specific job, we have to know maybe are there some best practices, some protocols and procedures that you can put into place up front to assist you be more successful throughout the case. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So. 
First and foremost, let's define court interpreting. What is court interpreting? Uh, I think this is important up front because we all have to be talking the same language, right, as we go forward. So let's chat a little bit about this just to make sure that we all understand really what this thing is that's called court interpreting. So court interpretation is the act of orally transferring meaning from one language to another in a variety of judicial settings, judicial proceedings, through the use of what we call interpreting modes, and there are several of those. Court interpreters are expected to convey every element of meaning of the source language message without adding, omitting, editing, simplifying, or embellishing. I mean, we just got to say what's said, right? Sounds easy. I mean, whatever they say, we say. Let's unpack that a little bit. So in other words, court interpreters must maintain the tone and the register of the original message, even if it's inappropriate, offensive, or unintelligible. So, uh, or, um, yeah, unintelligible, forgive me. So when we talk about tone and register, let's make sure we understand those concepts here. So tone really deals with emotion. It deals with the intonation that you hear in the voice. Did you do it? Yeah, yeah, I did it. Hell yeah, I did it. Did you do it? Yeah, yeah, I did it. The same answer, the same words were used. Very different message ultimately was relayed because of the tone, because of the intonation that was given. Interpreters have to maintain that to a large degree anyway when we interpret. That's important. That can change the outcome. That can change the perception, the judge's perception, the jury's perception based on the tone that is used. Register deals with formality, the formality of language. So, for example, sir, you are hereby remanded to the custody of the county detention center for a period of no less than 30 days. Nice and formal. It's a nice strong judge speech, right? And then the interpreter turns around and says, dude, you're going to the slammer for a month. Hmm, interesting. I said the same thing, same message got through, but I drastically changed the register. Ultimately, that changed the perception. You know, this guy's thinking, what? Who is this person talking to me? If a jury had heard that, if a judge had heard that, they would have gotten a drastically different perception of the speaker, right, than probably what was, what was real. That's important. Interpreters work with those concepts. An accurate interpretation is true to the actual meaning of what's being said. So it's important to understand that court interpreters deal with concepts. We deal with underlying meaning. We don't deal so much with words, per se. And I know that sounds strange, but you can't compare one language to another and give what are called literal translations or interpretations and expect something to make sense. Instead, what we do is transfer a meaning. We transfer a meaning from one language to another. If in the end of my interpreting rendition, all of the, what we might call, units of meaning that were in the original are present in the interpretation, and assuming that I have maintained tone and register, I win, right? My job is complete. I've done a good job there. What we have to realize is that word for word doesn't work. So what may take one word in one language may take several words in another language. You know, English happens to be a very succinct language. Um, each syllable is densely packed with meaning. And so what that means, it takes me less words, less syllables in English to say something than it does usually in most other languages. I work in Spanish. I happen to be a Spanish interpreter. And so this is certainly true going into Spanish. What I can say in English with one or two or three words, it may take me six or eight or ten words in Spanish. That's also the same reason why many times in court you see your interpreters running, right? They're sort of rather sprinting while they're interpreting almost. It's a race, right? And they're having to spit out those words because they have to say more of them than what was said in the initial English. So keep that in mind. Word for word doesn't work. It's meaning for meaning. That's the way that we work. Words are merely symbols to convey ideas. And our interpretation is to convey the idea stated in the original language in the very same style, tone, and intent used by the speaker. Again, we say what they say. It's, it's so simple, right? You just got to know a little bit about everything. That's all we do. So let's, um, let's get into an example here. If the defendant happens to be an illiterate hermit from a geographically isolated region of a distant and remote country, he or she should understand as much of the message as an illiterate and geographically isolated resident of the United States. Hmm, that's interesting. So the interpreter's job then is to place the non-English speaker on an equal footing with, not at an advantage to, an average layperson who understands ordinary English. You know, that's a little bit shocking to hear. So a lot of times, I think, when we are in a court setting 
And I, I think there's this misperception on a general level. So I think that interpreters struggle with this, uh, court personnel struggle with this, judges and attorneys, right? Um, people who utilize our services struggle with this. There's this comprehension, there's this perception that the interpreter is there to ensure that the person utilizing the interpreter's services, and here I'm talking about a person with limited English proficiency, we're there to ensure that that person understands the proceedings, understands the meaning of everything that's said. And we simply can't do that. Our role is to place that person, that limited English speaker, on an equal footing with your average English speaker. And you think about it, is it possible that an English speaker would potentially leave a hearing and not fully understand what happened? They heard everything in their own language. They heard all the concepts. They heard the attorneys and the judge speak back and forth. They were there. They were present. But they simply didn't have the knowledge necessary, the training necessary, to fully comprehend what they had heard. The same thing happens here. The interpreter's role is to place that person on an equal footing. And really, the idea of equal footing, that phrase sometimes is not quite accurate. I, I don't like the concept of equal footing as much as I like to say to provide an equal opportunity to participate. Because really, equal footing, that's something interpreters made up. That's not really found in any, any code anywhere, any law anywhere. But what we're really doing is giving that person an opportunity to participate, an opportunity to hear everything that's said and to act right according to what is said. That's really what we want. That's really our goal at the end of the day. The interpreter's task is not to ensure that the defendant understands the proceedings. I know that sounds crazy. All we can do, though, is allow that person to hear the proceedings, to hear what is said in a language that he or she should understand. Beyond that, who knows, right? I can't look at the guy and tell what's going on in his or her head, right? I just, it's impossible for us to know. So we're there to allow that person to participate, hopefully to participate fully. And that's it. If a person doesn't understand, well, there are judges, there are attorneys, there are people whose job it is to actually explain those types of, uh, those types of issues. The interpreter essentially, again, says what's been said in court, no more, no less. So at the end of the day, a non-English speaker should be able to understand only as much of the message as an English speaker with the same level of education and intelligence. An English speaker walks out, didn't fully understand something, they have to turn to their attorney and say, what just happened? Same thing with a, a person with limited English proficiency. It, our goal is to make that same dynamic exist in those situations as well, right? Now, I want to make sure that we understand a little bit, again, at the beginning of the presentation here, understand a little bit about the difference between interpretation and translation. And a lot of times these terms are used interchangeably. You'll go to court and someone will say, hey, where's the translator? The translator's here, right? Or somebody will give you a document and say, can you in interpret this? I want to just make sure that we're on the same page in terms of these terms of art. So when we talk about interpretation, right, we're talking about something that always deals with the transfer of word, transfer of meaning via the spoken word. Okay, so when we interpret something, it's always an oral exercise. Interpretation is purely oral in its practice, and it's generally, by the way, done on the fly. You walk in, I don't exactly know what the parties are going to say, and I have to interpret out loud. I have an audience of some type. My audience may be all the English speakers, if I'm going from the foreign language into English, or it may be simply one person with limited English proficiency, and I'm hearing the English, and I'm transferring that meaning into the other language. Sort of depends on the direction I'm going, right? Either way, it's still an oral exercise. Interpreting is, in the U.S. is mostly performed from English into another language, Right? So from English, in my case, into Spanish. And you think about that. In court, there are really very few opportunities for someone to actually speak, a, a defendant, let's say, to actually speak. So normally what that person is doing is listening to constant English right back and forth. There's discussions in English. There, there are judges speaking in English, attorneys speaking in English, other witnesses speaking in English. It's very rare for the defendant to actually have an opportunity to speak. Now, when that person does speak, of course, for the interpreter, that opens up a whole different realm of possibilities. But for the most part, what we're doing is listening to the English and interpreting simultaneously into the other language, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in, in just a bit. 
Meaning is what matters most. I want to make sure that I mention that again. You'll hear me say that throughout this, uh, this presentation. Word for word doesn't work. It's, maybe you've said to an interpreter before, look, I want you to say word for word to him what I'm saying to you. You really don't want that. That really isn't going to make sense. What you really want is meaning for meaning, concept for concept. I want to make sure that you fully transfer what I'm saying into the other language, right? I know word for word doesn't work. What works is meaning for meaning, right? We deal with concepts. All right, now, on the other side of that, let's talk about translation. So translation deals with the transfer of one language into another via the written word. So we're talking about documents. You give me a written document, I look at it, I consider it. I may have lots of time, actually, to think about this document, reflect upon the proper way to get it into the other language, and then ultimately I create a new document right, a new written document in that other language. Translation always involves some type of text. Translation typically allows for more time to study the text in question. Uh, I may have a few minutes, I may have a few hours, a few days, I may have weeks, but it gives me a little bit more time to study, to research, to reflect upon the proper translation, right? Although meaning is paramount, as always, we also do take great care to preserve the structure of the original text to the extent possible. You know, that's not as much of a concern in interpreting. So when I go into court, sometimes you have no choice but to move things around a bit. Uh, so we talk about syntax. What syntax means, that's the order that words are found in within a sentence. Okay, so in English we may say, uh, the boy jumped high right? Uh, the book was given to the girl. The apple is red. Just because it's that way in one language, though, doesn't mean it's the same in the other language. And many times, when I'm interpreting on the fly, I've got to make all kinds of adjustments for it to make sense in that other language. When we do translations, although those adjustments, of course, are still going to be necessary, um, we do take great care to, t to try and maintain that original structure to the extent possible. We try to be faithful to the original author's intent when they wrote that document. Um, and sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. But we do give that a little bit more consideration in the process of translation, right? So keep that in mind. You know, one of the, um, the, the banes of the modern day professional interpreter is, is being called a translator and probably vice versa. You know, you get to court and they're like, where's the translator? Send him in. Eh, you know, uh, probably interpreting 101, call the interpreter, interpreter, a translator, a translator, right? All right, so now that we've sort of built that foundation of what court interpreting is, a little bit about how we work, I want to talk about a couple of different roles that we have here in Kentucky uh, in judicial settings. And this is very important. So I was fortunate enough to present um, at this, this same uh, program a few years ago now. Um, I presented at the, uh, the Kentucky Law Update. It's been, I don't know, five or six years ago. And since that time, we actually have had some pretty substantial updates to our administrative procedures. And so the information that I'm going to give you now is, is fairly new. Um, and again, this is reflected in our protocol documents that have gone through some major revisions just over the past few years. And I think it's important that we spend a little time talking about it. This is something that is generally misunderstood. Um, I think that, again, interpreters misunderstand this. Court personnel, judges sometimes misunderstand this. Um, and attorneys, practicing attorneys, will misunderstand this. And this can cause confusion. Um, it can cause frustration. And um, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. So there are two roles that we're going to be talking about today. And Really, there, there's a third role as well that we won't really get into. Um, I want to focus on these, but I'll mention that third role in passing in just a moment. But we're going to sort of focus our attention on these two roles at first. There's what we call the sworn proceedings interpreter. And then there's also something that we call the private linguistic expert. And what has happened is that in the past, the same interpreter sort of did both of these things in, in the same location at the same time. And that really can't work for a variety of reasons. So I want to preface my comments by saying that when we talk about, talk about these roles, it's important to realize that like most things in, in court, right, like most roles that are played by all of the participants in court, the interpreter's behavior is ultimately governed by the rules of evidence, 
okay? So there are specific rules that are in place to ensure, essentially, to protect the integrity of the judicial process. The interpreter fits into that. The interpreter is not separate from that. The interpreter is not this, um, you know, this crazy uh, made-up party that floats from one location to another and essentially has no regard for the rules of evidence. No, we are governed by those rules. We have to take those into consideration. And so when we talk about these roles, keep in mind that this is set up, again, to protect the integrity of the judicial process and to fit within the well-established rules of evidence that we all play by, of course. So let's talk first about the sworn proceedings interpreter. That really is probably what you're thinking of as a court interpreter. When you go to court in Kentucky, in a state court in Kentucky, the court interpreter walks in, that person has been sent by the administrative office of the courts, that person is either contracted or on staff with the Office of Language Access, that person is a sworn proceedings interpreter. It's a very specific role that that person plays. On the other side of the coin, we have something called the private linguistic expert. There are many phrases that you might hear uh, that people use to describe this person. It might be called the table interpreter because they sit at the table with the attorneys. It might be called the check interpreter because they check the work of the other interpreters in the courtroom. The monitor interpreter, again, because they monitor the interpretation of the sworn proceedings interpreters. The party interpreter, they work for the parties. It's not that they're you know, living it up. It's not nearly as cool as it sounds. The defense or prosecution interpreter, because they were hired specifically by the defense or the prosecution. They go by all of these names, but it's the same thing. We will call all of those things, for our purposes today, the private linguistic expert. So let's talk about them a little bit. Let's unpack those concepts to make sure we understand what they are. Um, again, this can cause some frustration if we're not on the same page in terms of how both of these entities work. So the sworn proceedings interpreter. This interpreter, when they go into court, they are under oath. Whether they take an oath in the courtroom at that time or not, they're still under oath. They actually have to sign an oath uh, with the AOC, with the Office of Language Access, uh, at the time they're contracted uh, as a, an independent interpreter or at the time that they're hired as a staff interpreter. So they are under oath. This person is an officer of the court. We'll talk about that more in a moment. We can think of this person to some degree as an extension of the bench. So sometimes when you look at the work of the court interpreter, there's obviously a lot of interaction between that court interpreter and usually the defense, because typically they're interpreting for the defendant, right? The defendant with limited English proficiency. And it's sort of perceived, erroneously, I might add, that that person somehow lines up with the defense, that that person's ethics is somehow intertwined uh, with those of the defense. And that's really not true. If anything, we, we line up much more closely with the judge, with the bench. We are impartial. Um, there are specific roles, uh, rules that govern how we interact with each party. It's important to remember that. So we're not necessarily working for the defense or the defendant, even though we do interact quite a bit. We're not working for witnesses that happen to be presented by the prosecution right, or opposing counsel. We're actually lining up very closely with the judge, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, remember, the primary function is to provide assistance to the court in communicating with all the parties um, that happen to be limited English proficient. So we're really there to serve that bench and ultimately to make sure that the wheels of justice continue to turn. That's important. There are evidentiary considerations that I mentioned. We are bound by the rules of evidence when we work as sworn proceedings interpreters. Let's talk a little bit about the definition. So this definition is uh, found within the KCOJ language access plan and procedures. This is the document that I was describing a few moments ago uh, when I said that there have been some substantial updates to the way that we do business over the past few years. And so that's really what we have here. This is now how we define the work of the sworn proceedings interpreter. Let's just read through it together. Has taken an oath to provide complete, unbiased, and accurate interpretation between English speakers and defendants, litigants, victims, or witnesses with limited English proficiency or who are deaf or hard of hearing during court proceedings or direct services. Obviously, we understand court proceeding. Um, that sometimes can be difficult to, to define or it can be hard to discern if something qualifies as a court proceeding or not. Uh, essentially, the way that we do that on our side, just by the way, as an FYI, if there is some representative uh, and I'm talking about direct services here as well, there must be some representative from the Kentucky Court of Justice within the meeting in order for an actual sworn proceedings interpreter to be able to 
to interpret, okay, for one to be able to be assigned. And so if there are private conversations that take place in the hallway, and let's say there's no judge, uh, there's no other court of justice employee, right? There's no court designated worker. There's no pretrial officer. There's nothing. There's just maybe a, a, an attorney and a client talking in the hallway. That is not considered a court proceedings or a direct service. We can't actually be there. Um, and so specifically, let's go to bullet point number two, and we'll get a little bit more into that. The sworn proceedings interpreter is an impartial officer of the court and may not participate in the facilitation of private and or privileged communication between non-court of justice entities and individuals with limited English proficiency or who are deaf or hard of hearing. Again, that just means if there is no representative there within a specific setting from the Kentucky Court of Justice, our interpreters just can't participate. This is obviously not one of our more popular rules, so I want to make sure that we're we, we are on the same page up front to, again, avoid that confusion down the line. So, you know, what that means, you go to court, you see an interpreter there, you're, you're an attorney. You could be a public defender, you could be a private defense attorney, or you could be a prosecutor for that matter. Uh, you go to court and um, there is someone who doesn't speak English that you need to interact with. And you've never had an opportunity to hire your, your own interpreter yet. Uh, there, there may be no funding. There's many different issues that could come up, but for one reason or another, you haven't been able to interact with that person, with the witness or with your client. So you get there and you see the court interpreter and you ask, hey, can you come out in the hallway? I need about 10 minutes with my client. Just need to understand sort of what went on, sort of prepare a little bit. So you ask the interpreter to do that. Can the interpreter do it? Uh-uh-uh, that's what this says. You've got to be very careful. This is the, the frustration. Now, at times, if a judge orders us to do so, we will. The problem is that could lead to adverse procedural consequences down the line. We want to try to avoid that. The reason for this rule is not to be punitive. Um, there are a few different motives behind this, but the main one is just to protect the integrity of the judicial process. And we'll get into that in just a little bit more. Let's go forward here, but I want to make sure that we're clear on this before moving ahead. So. This interpreter, the sworn proceedings interpreter, is an officer of the court. This is, to define this, an officer of the court means a person who is charged with upholding the law and administering the judicial process. Again, think about being uh, governed by those rules of evidence. We have a responsibility to make sure that things are done the right way to protect the integrity of the judicial, the judicial process. Officers of the court include judges, attorneys, clerks, bailiffs, sheriffs, and of course, the sworn proceedings interpreter, right? Now, let's go to the other side of this, the private linguistic expert. So that same scenario, an attorney comes to court and um, for one reason or another has not been able to interact with his or her client. And you ask the sworn proceedings interpreter to do it, and that person is trained to go through what we just talked about, uh, ethical limitations, the Supreme Court order that prohibits us from doing so, right? There's some pretty strong language there. That person will diplomatically inform you, um, may diplomatically, diplomatically inform the judge that we can't do that work. And so you're thinking, well, what, what can I do? What, how do I interact with this guy? Well, what you need is this. You need this private linguistic expert. Let's talk about this guy a little bit. So this person's not under oath and is not an officer of the court, at least not in that role at that moment. This is the linguistic expert who would provide constitutional access to counsel. Uh, this person can interpret privileged and or private communication. And one role that this person would play is potentially monitoring the work of the sworn proceedings interpreter. So I very much want you to approach this dynamic, this situation, as you would um, in deciding upon hiring any other type of expert, right? You need a fingerprint expert. You go out and um, you do some research and you find the most qualified expert that you can. Same thing with this private linguistic expert. It's that type of role that this person would play. This person is, on some degree, an impartial entity. They're not necessarily advocating for you and doing everything possible to win your case, but they are part of the defense team or the prosecution team, right? They're working in conjunction, providing their expert services to you, and they certainly can interpret, again, those privileged and or private communication. The thing is, the AOC, the Office of Language Access, only provides interpreters for, again, that very specific setting, which is a court proceeding or a direct service offered by the Kentucky Court of Justice. But we can't get into case preparation. Bad things happen when we do. Um, there's no guarantee, necessarily, that 
uh, an opposing attorney wouldn't be able to get the information that you shared uh, through what you thought was privileged communication. The sworn proceedings interpreter isn't really a part of that that privilege communication. We're not included in that privilege, right? Because we're the court's resource. You can't really take the court's resource and ex have any expectation of privacy. It's not to say the interpreter would turn around and tell what you just said. There's still confidentiality. But we can't guarantee that somebody wouldn't necessarily be able to get to the information that you just shared because we're not part of that privilege. Got to be really careful here. Privilege is, is very nuanced. So I don't want to get into a deep conversation on how that works. But that sworn proceedings interpreter, know that that person doesn't really belong, isn't really included within that privilege that you share with the client. That's very important. Also, I think this last point here is important to mention again. So the work of the private linguistic expert includes potentially monitoring the sworn proceedings interpreter. And that's very important because I think sometimes we take for granted that what the sworn proceedings interpreter says is unquestionable. It's uh, beyond reproach. It's, it's absolutely correct and precise. I would like to tell you that that's true. I am a sworn proceedings interpreter. Um, we make mistakes sometimes. Uh, we make few mistakes, fewer mistakes as we learn, but they're going to happen. One of those mistakes may even be large enough to drastically affect the outcome of your case. Having your own private linguistic expert with you at council table will assist you in avoiding those types of issues because what that allows you to do is understand what's being said in the other language, consider whether or not an objection should be lodged, right? Um, and then to ultimately make that objection, and then you're protected for a potential appeal in the future. If you say nothing, if you realize nothing at that moment, if you don't realize that an error has been made, you really lose the possibility uh, to appeal in the future based on a faulty interpretation. We don't want that, obviously. Now, those mistakes should be few and far between, but do they happen? I can tell you, as someone who's been in this field quite a while, on an administrative level, yes, they do. Uh, yes, they do happen, unfortunately. Let's define the private linguistic expert, again, according to the Kentucky Court of Justice Language Access Plan and Procedures. So this is an interpreter or other language professional hired by a non-Court of Justice entity, and that just means anyone who doesn't work directly for the Court of Justice, right? Um, this person may facilitate private and or privileged communication between a party with limited English proficiency and the non-Court of Justice entity. So this is the individual through whom you're able to communicate with the client with limited English proficiency. The role may include monitoring the accuracy of the sworn proceedings interpreter. Not an officer of the court, at least not at that time, right? And this person may participate in the facilitation of private and or privileged communication. Now, what we have to realize here, it's an interesting dynamic how this works, actually. So the, the AOC, and specifically the Office of Language Access, my office, we contract with dozens of interpreters, sworn proceedings interpreters, right? We have about 150 active contracts right now besides the staff interpreters that we have, okay? And those interpreters may work in a variety of capacities. When they're working for us, they work within the role, the parameters that we defined previously, those of the sworn proceedings interpreter. But you absolutely could use those very same interpreters, uh, and in that capacity, they would fall into this category of the private linguistic expert. It's sort of a different set of ethics, a different set of parameters that go along with that role. But the very same interpreters may interpret in court sometimes, and they may interpret as a private linguistic expert privately for you for case preparation. What we can't have is an interpreter who is crossing roles within the same case. So my sworn proceedings interpreter on a specific case can't cross over into the role of the private linguistic expert, not on that same case, right? And vice versa. If you start as a private linguistic expert on a specific case, you can't jump over to the sworn proceedings interpreter, not generally speaking, right? Our rule of thumb from an interpreting perspective, if the interpreter is receiving compensation from more than one place, from more than one bucket on a specific case, there's probably an ethical issue there, right? So again, think about protecting the integrity of the, ju the judicial process. Think about avoiding um, the perception of a conflict of interest. There could certainly be a conflict for that interpreter. And then there's also a very real problem in terms of that interpreter's impartiality. You can't really prepare the case, you know, on one side and maybe on the other side and then go in front of the judge and really expect to be completely impartial. Right? You sort of heard the story here, you've heard the story here, and then you get in front of the judge, and are you really impartial at that point? Uh, it's questionable at best. You have to be careful. 
There are times when decisions must be made um, due to resources, due to a lack of resources for an interpreter to play both of these roles. And those should be the exception, not the rule. So if you have a case that requires a hard to find language, right, a language that isn't readily available in Kentucky, and maybe we have exactly one interpreter for that. And so that's obviously the sworn proceedings interpreter, and hey, you gotta interact with your client. Potentially, an exception can be made, but those, again, should be the exception and not the rule, and all of that should be disclosed to the judge. In fact, all parties should agree that it's okay to move forward. The judge should give the blessing for that to happen. Um, the interpreter should not be the one making that decision. It should be a mutual decision among both sides, right, all parties, with the judge's knowledge and consent, right? Um, we have to do that on occasion. Happens rarely, but it could happen. That, again, should be the exception, not the rule. So let's talk a little bit about why we even have spoken language interpreters in the first place. Uh, just to go through this, we'll go through this sort of quickly, and then we'll come back in just a little while to this dynamic of sworn proceedings interpreter versus the private linguistic expert. So why do we have spoken language interpreters? Just a few legal points for you guys. Of course, there's something called due process, right? The right to be present that's been interpreted to mean that the defendant has a right to hear the proceedings in a language that he or she understands. Notice it does not say to understand the proceeding. They have to hear that proceeding in a language they can understand, but I can't control what they actually understand up here. And again, we're there to provide that equal footing or that equal opportunity to participate. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, every criminal defendant has a right to aid in his or her own defense. An LEP, and that means limited English proficiency, an LEP speaker cannot communicate effectively with legal counsel unless an interpreter is provided. Now, that is a reason why there must be an interpreter, but that's not an obligation for the court per se to pay for that interaction. Be careful here. So although the obligation exists, we get into who provides what, and that's where we get those, that distinction between the private linguistic expert and the sworn proceedings interpreter. Okay, there must be access to counsel, absolutely. Does the court have a responsibility to provide that? Mm, be careful there. Reason number three, of course, there's Title VI is interpreted by Executive Order 13166, which does mandate linguistic access for any recipient of federal funds. And I've given you the link here in case you want to take a look at it. This was signed by Bill Clinton way back when. And what that says is that if an organization receives any federal funding, right, even a dollar of federal funding, they must provide a language access plan. People get into trouble when this doesn't happen. I know, I speak from experience, because the AOC has gotten in trouble a few times. Don't let that happen to you. If your organization receives any type of federal funding, you are absolutely responsible for a language access plan, because you have to provide your services to anyone, no matter what language that they speak, right? Be careful with that. It's not fun to deal with the Department of Justice on these things, I know. Laws related to court interpreting services, we won't go through this extensively, but I just want to make sure here that we are, um, we're okay. This is more for you to review and go back to later if the need were to arise. Of course, we could talk about Amendment 6 and 14 of the U.S. Constitution. We just mentioned Title 6 of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There's Title 2 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, KRS, Kentucky Revised Statute, actually provides some guidance on this as well, specifically in Section 30A.400 through 435. And then there are the rules that I just mentioned, right? The Rules of Administrative Procedures of the Kentucky Court of Justice. It's our language access plan and procedures. I'll give you the link to that at the end of this presentation. It's a very important document because it really does dictate how we work in court. Um, it's got some pretty strong language regarding the role of the interpreter. Take a look at that if you have a chance. We won't go through these slides in depth. Just a couple of things that we'll mention here. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. These are some of the basics, of course. And in the end, what it means is no discrimination based on race, color, national origin in federally subsidized programs or activity, and national origin discrimination equals language-based discrimination. Keep that in mind. Again, if you receive federal funds, even a dollar, you are responsible for making sure that there's a language access plan, and that would extend beyond just the service that maybe your division or your office provides. So if your office is part of a larger organization and only your office receives one dollar of federal funding, the whole organization is responsible for providing a language access plan. People get into a lot of trouble over that. Let's see here, we won't go through this, just some specific sections of uh, Title VI that uh, describe what we were discussing. I'll let you guys read through that on your own here. 
just some basic information for you guys. Again, talking a little bit more about the responsibility of federal financial recipients. And I'll let you guys review these on your own. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, services offered by public entities must be accessible to qualified individuals with disabilities. And here's a bit of information on that. Quick story about the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I've been with the, the state, with uh, the state of Kentucky, the administrative office of the courts for, uh, for several years, for quite a while. And not too long ago, I actually left. I left for a period of almost two years and I took a position with the federal courts. Um, I actually was the supervisory staff interpreter for the Southern District of Florida. So my family and I moved down to Miami, Florida, and we spent almost two years there. Um, it was fantastic to work in that environment. Uh, the work itself was pretty incredible. You can imagine being a court interpreter, a Spanish interpreter in a place like Miami. The stories that I've heard would, uh, would surprise you, I'm sure. You know, when I got there, the, the title that I had, again, was Supervisory Staff Interpreter. I was the scheduling coordinator. You know, besides interpreting, I, interp I, I was in charge of all the schedule. And then I was also, according to the job description, the coordinator for the ADA, the ADA coordinator, Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I, I get there on my first day, and I, I talk to my, my supervisor, and I talk to the clerk of court, and I say, all right, so from an ADA perspective, what do you guys need me to do? How does that work here? And they sort of looked at me and grinned and even giggled a little bit. And the thing is, the ADA doesn't apply to federal courts. It's very interesting because, you know, here in the state courts, of course, we work very, very hard to make sure that we're compliant with the ADA and with all of the other federal guidance. And in federal courts, it's not really a thing. They sort of have some agreements that say that sometimes they'll offer some of the same um, accommodations that the ADA offers, but they can make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not really something that they take into consideration. It doesn't apply to the federal court system. Just a little food for for a thought there, a fun fact, if you will. So needless to say, my ADA experience with the federal judiciary there was very different um, than the experience I've had here in Kentucky with what we, we do. In fact, there were times where we denied accommodations. Um, the clerk of court could deny accommodations uh, based on other factors related to the case. And we did that actually on a couple of occasions. Very interesting, huh? All right, so I'll let you guys read through these a little bit. We won't get into this. Just some basic information for you to go back through should you ever find yourself in a situation to need it. Let's go forward here just a little bit. Let's talk now about what expectations you should have as an attorney when you interact with an interpreter, right? Whether it's in court or outside of court with one of these private linguistic experts. Let's just talk a little bit about how this thing may go, right? What, what to expect, uh, how the whole thing may pan out. So. If you represent a person with limited English proficiency, LEP, or who is deaf or hard of hearing, what should you expect of the interpreter? So I want to talk about the private linguistic expert and the sworn proceedings interpreter. Uh, the private linguistic expert is, I should clarify, hired by you, okay, or your organization perhaps. The sworn proceedings interpreter is appointed by the court. That's the AOC court interpreter that we've been talking about a little bit. So when you hire an interpreter, these are some guidelines that I want you to consider. First off, and I put this first for a reason, there's interpreter certification or other pro professional credentials. And as it says at the bottom here, remember that in life you really do get what you pay for. If you, you go the cheap way and you, you find somebody who will do it for free, and maybe this person is a friend or a relative, it could be a bilingual office worker that you have, just know that there could be some issues down, downstream. Uh, that could come up if you're not using the services of a credentialed court interpreter. Um, those individuals that you may be hiring may be very bilingual. It's possible that they are excellent in both languages, but that doesn't necessarily qualify them to do that type of work, and it doesn't mean that they're able to maintain accuracy within the specific judicial setting. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea about this, we talk about the state certification, the, the state level credential that is required for an interpreter to become a sworn proceedings interpreter and to interpret in court. That is a national level exam, and that exam actually has, on a national level, about a 10% pass rate. In Kentucky, it's much lower, actually. It varies a little depending upon how large the bilingual population is in a given state. In Kentucky, we don't have that many highly educated bilingual people, and so our pass rate happens to be a little bit lower. So let's take on this national average, this 10%. 
okay, this 10% pass rate, um, it's very likely that the person that you would be using, if they're not credentialed, if they're not certified, would not really have the qualifications to pass that exam. So I want you to be very careful with that. Ask good questions up front, right? Many languages do not have a certification exam. There may be languages uh, for which you need an interpreter that don't have this type of certification exam. If that's the case, that's fine. But again, look for other professional credentials. Specifically, look at education. Look at background and experience. Has this person actually worked in this type of setting before? Look for specialized knowledge. Not all cases are the same, and not all cases will require the same type of interpreter. Do you need an interpreter with specific knowledge of a certain area of law or a certain concept? Um, a certain expertise, perhaps, that will assist you in interacting with that client. Make sure you're asking those types of questions. Think about other pertinent qualifications, right? All of it is related to what your needs are in preparing for that specific case. Also, of course, think about professional conduct, uh, conduct and adherence to the assigned role. Bad things can happen when interpreters don't follow interpreter ethics. Um, it can be very um, unknowingly, it can be done inadvertently, but if the interpreter that you hire, if the private linguistic expert that you hire does not adhere, adhere to that specific role, um, if that person were to make a procedural mistake along the way, that could have very severe consequences for you down, down the, the line. Um, ultimately could cause a very different outcome than the one you were hoping for. So be very careful here. And again, just to repeat, in life you really do get what you pay for. Um, this is true of interpreters. Uh, interpreters Good interpreters uh, are generally worth the expense, right? Typically, they're paid for by the hour, but you would come to that agreement with your private linguistic expert. In the end, whatever you pay for them up front, you will get back tenfold um, in terms of the quality of your case preparation along the way. Keep that in mind. That's very, very important. Also keep in mind, you should approach this just like you do with any other expert. So if you're looking at the credentials of someone, the professional credentials of someone, and you're trying to decide, okay, should I hire this person or not as my interpreter? Think for a moment about the other side and what they may be bringing to the table. If opposing counsel brings a super duper qualified interpreter, certified, right, all the bells and whistles, they bring that person to court, and you go the cheap route, and you try to find somebody um, who'll do it for free because, you know, they told you they speak this language, whoever has the ex best expert typically wins. Be very careful with that. You could lose before you ever get started just because somebody, right, they went the extra mile and they got the, the expert that was needed for that case. So be very careful. The, the best interpreter will typically, um, will typically allow you to, to tip the scales in your favor just because they're more aware of what's needed to happen. Linguistically, uh, the case itself will be more sound. They'll be able to catch more errors in court. The best interpreter will win. Be careful with that. So. In terms of the court interpreter, the sworn proceedings interpreter, here's what you can expect. That person must render everything said in court in the source language into the target language. So they hear it in English, and they spit it out, right? And it has to be perfect. It's got to be accurate. Remember, we talked about maintaining register and tone. We talked about um, there can be no omissions, no additions. Those things are very important. It must be accurate. It must be done without any changes in style, tone, or register with as little delay or interference with the court proceeding as possible, and it must be done impartially, and this is the key, right? May not perform duties beyond the scope of the role of the sworn proceedings interpreter. And so you may get a little pushback. You may ask them to do something that they simply can't do, and they will diplomatically tell you, you know, we can't do it, and this is the reason why. But they'll probably offer another solution. They'll help you overcome the barriers, but they may not, may not be able to do everything that you need them to do because of those very specific limitations that we talked about, right? So how does the interpreter maintain accuracy? We've talked a lot about that. Let's get into that a little bit more right now. We know that that's a requirement. That's what you can expect when you go into court, right? How does that really work? Well, interpreters shall be accurate and complete. That's canon one of our interpreting code of ethics here in the state of Kentucky. Why should our interpretation be accurate and complete? Well, think about equal footing. Think about equal opportunity to participate. If that person had spoken English, they would have heard everything, right? Even if it's nonsensical, unintelligible, offensive, they would have heard it all. And that is the interpreter's role as well, to make sure that that person gets that opportunity to hear it all, right? How do we do that? Well, we maintain register. Think about legalese, right, versus slang. Think about acronyms. We maintain all of that to the, to the best of our ability in the other language. Your slang should sound like slang. Your legalese should sound like legalese. We don't want a person 
who um, has zero education sounding like he has a PhD in English, and we don't want your PhD in English sounding like they have no education at all. So we maintain those things along the way. There's best word choice. Interpreters deal with this, right? There are lots of correct options, but we find the best option given the context of what's being said, and we work with nuances. It's a very nuanced art that we perform. Also, obscenities, part of the job. Um, some interpreters would say perhaps the best part of the job. I don't know, you tell me. But if your client says something that you'd rather them not say, this interpreter has an obligation to say it. That goes in both directions. So if they spit something out that perhaps would be less than favorable um, for your side of the case, prefer, prefer maybe for the judge and jury not to hear that, right? Well, if they say it, we have to maintain it to the best of our ability at the same level, right? Same register. Also idioms, culturally bound terms, units of measure, things like cool as a cucumber, sushi, right? Those things will be converted into the other language on a case-by-case -case basis depending upon what's linguistically appropriate. So cool as a cucumber, remember we deal with concepts. If you say that to me in English, and if I say those words literally in Spanish, if I say, you know, literally in Spanish, está tan frío, tan fresco como un pepino. I mean, literally somebody would look at me like, like they had no idea. They, they would say, what's wrong with him? What, what happened to him? Is he okay? Is he dead? Why was he so cold? What is this cucumber you talk of? I mean, had no idea. But there's an equivalent idiom that I can say in Spanish. For example, I can say that he's as fresh as a lettuce, and somebody would absolutely understand the meaning that we're trying to get across. Interpreters deal with those concepts along the way. Sushi is a culturally bound term. Sushi is sushi no matter what language you're speaking in. So they say sushi, we say sushi. Right? We don't describe it. You know, delicious raw fish with rice and wasabi sauce. No, it's not that. It's just sushi. Meters, gallons, inches, pounds, we don't convert. If they say, how tall was the guy? Well, he was 1.85. 1.85 what? Was he real little? little? Little bitty guy? No, he's 1.85 meters. Oh, okay, he's about six feet, right? We'll keep those as is. You guys have to work that out along the way. Keep that in mind. So our challenge, as we mentioned before, we have to render the same meaning not the same words. Word for word gets you in trouble. Concept for concept, meaning for meaning. That's what we're dealing with here. It sounds easy, right? Just say what's said. So the interpreter's like a magic telephone. We simply say it in English, right? Go through the telephone in English, and it comes out on the other side in the other language, but there's no distortion in between. So we say it on one side, it comes out on the other, and it should be magically appropriate in the other language. All right, so let's practice a little bit. Let's see here. I want to talk about the different types of modes that we have. Make sure that you understand how we work. So there's site translation. Site translation. Remember we talked about how translation was always deals with some type of text. Site translation is the same. Court interpreters work in this mode sometimes. So we get to court and there's a document. The document could be in English, probably some type of administrative form. We would take the document. We would read it for a couple of minutes. Don't get frustrated if the interpreter asks for time to do this. It takes a little while. you got to read this stuff, all right? So we read through this. We take two or three minutes. And then we read it out loud in the other language. And ideally, it should sound as though it were written in that foreign language. That's a lofty goal. Many interpreters don't ever make it there. But that's how we, we strive to work anyway. Typically, this is done from English into the foreign language. As a side note, if you, as a practicing attorney, bring foreign language documentation in court, the judge will not be able to accept it in that foreign language, and that sworn proceedings interpreter can't help you because that's preparation of evidence. Be careful there. So you are required to prepare any evidentiary material in a format that the court can accept. And in Kentucky, the official language of the court is English. You have to present that in English, and that sworn proceedings interpreter can't help you. Be careful there. Consecutive interpretation, it's a dialogue. Right? So, what is your name? Stop. What is your name in the other language? Stop. The LEP says, my name is Joshua Elliott. Stop. The interpreter renders the interpretation into English. My name is Joshua Elliott. Stop. And so it's this back and forth. You can think about using this on the witness stand. Right? If somebody actually has to testify and that person doesn't speak English, the interpreter would be that intermediary. The, all the information would flow through that interpreter. That's how we interpret. And then they're simultaneous. Why do we have a picture of this on here? What is this picture? Looks like a bunch of guys. They're not having a good day. I see one guy in front. He's not very happy. What is this? Well, this is actually a picture from the Nuremberg trials. Um, and as you see in the front row there, some of the guys have on headsets, 
right? And, and one gentleman is sort of like this. He's not having a good day. Those are Nazi officers that are being tried for their crimes, and those headsets are leading to interpreter booths, and you have interpreters interpreting simultaneously for these officers as the proceeding goes along. That was actually the first time that simultaneous interpretation was ever used, certainly in the judicial proceeding. We've come a long way since then. It was a very laborious, slow process. We've come a long, long way. And now what you typically get when you go to court, assuming that everybody can be there on site, I know that's not the case right now, but assuming that we can, interpreters mostly interpret simultaneously. So a judge speaking English, the attorney speaking English, and the interpreter listening right, and interpreting simultaneously. Typically, the LEP will have on a headset. They're a little bit better than these that we see here, but they have on some type of headset. And we are transmitting, right, to that person directly through our wireless interpreting equipment so that it, the process is seamless for the, all of the participants, right? Judges like this, attorneys like this, simply because there is, um, there's no lag. When we do consecutive, you gotta wait, right? You wait, stop for the interpretation, stop, answer, stop. Simultaneous means that we can do it nonstop along the way. The problem recently has been, of course, that we're providing all services virtually because of COVID-19. And when we do that, most of the time, that means that we do it consecutively. And so therefore, you can expect there to be a little bit of a lag when you go into court. Um, although the technology is catching up and we're doing something simultaneously now um, through different tools that are available to us. All right, so let's finish up here. Last but not least, tips for working with interpreters. Let's see. For clients with limited English proficiency, think about how you establish basic communication. Think about relative, relevant information about the client, education, culture, country. Remember, not all interpreters are gonna be the same. Think about someone that will help you in your specific case communicate directly with your client based on that client's needs. If you have a deaf client or clients that are hard of hearing, how do you establish that basic communication? Is note taking okay? Make sure you ask permission. Be careful, not all individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing can write English, at least not fluently. In fact, most deaf individuals um, have a fluency in written English that equals that of about a fifth grader. Keep that in mind, it's a foreign language for them. Ask if it's okay, ask if they feel comfortable doing that. Lip reading, beware of the limitations. It can really wear somebody out and not everybody can do it. Do a language assessment up front with your private linguistic expert. Find what works best for that person. Remember, each case is gonna be different. It will require a different solution. Put some time and effort into it. Remember, this is important. It's the attorney's responsibility to effectively communicate with the client. Not doing so is ineffective assistance of counsel. Be careful here. You have to prepare that case outside of court. You can't use the court, court's resources. Feel free to give my office a call if you need help in identifying the right resource. We're here for general consultation. We'll help you identify the right interpreter, but that's just sort of part of working with that community. You have to provide that type of communication. Very, very important. Determine the need. Do you need an interpreter, a translator? Do you need assistant listening technology? Remember, interpreter, translator, we know the difference now. Who needs the interpreter? Is it the party, the witness, the non-party, the deaf attorney? Specify the language, and even within the language, is it a sub-dialect? Think of all these things as you go forward, right? Make the court aware of your need for a sworn proceedings interpreter in a timely manner. We ask for at least a two weeks notice, of course, if at all possible. And remember that services may and right now will be provided remotely. Take that into consideration as you prepare your case. That can affect how you present uh, the information. Remember the role of the sworn proceedings interpreter versus that of the private linguistic expert. Make sure that you have a very clear understanding of that when you go in so that we don't find ourselves in those frustrating, confusing situations, right? Conduct a pre-session with your private linguistic expert. Sit down with that person, ask about their credentials, and then tell them about the services you need. They are not limited to only interpreting. They're a part of your team, right? They're impartial, of course, but they still can provide other services that your sworn proceedings interpreter cannot. They can give you cultural advice. They can give you an opinion. They can help you with transcriptions or translations. They can help you uh, question the accuracy of another interpretation. There's a lot of things that they can offer. Talk with them about the services that they're comfortable providing. Remember, bad things happen when interpreters break role.
all right? Some resources just to finish up. I talked about some of these documents along the way. I've given you links here. There's the Kentucky Court of Justice Language Access Plan and Procedure. There's also the Code of Conduct for Sworn Proceedings Interpreter. And then I've given you the certification policies that our contracted and staff interpreters have to abide by here at the Office of Language Access. As I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have any questions. I'd love to hear from you. This is my email address. That's my cell phone number. Feel free to give me a call. This is our web page. We've got lots of great information on there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to wish you guys well. Thank you for this time today. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, please take care of yourselves. Uh, we'll leave you with a personal message. I know times are hard. I know that things are, are very strange. If you fall down, get back up. We need you. Keep working hard. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.